Well, surprise, we're not done with our study of the book of John yet. Anybody else excited and happy to see that? Uh, I know last week, or was it last week? I think, you know, recently we just ended up uh, finishing the book. I preached on the last chapter, and yet here we are. We actually have two parts left to go. Uh, if you're new, our church has been uh, journeying through the book of John all year so far, and it's been a really great study. Um, we have actually lined up miraculously, so we were reading about John's take on Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, we are reading about John's recounting of Maundy Thursday. On Maundy Thursday, and John's telling of Easter on Easter, to make that happen, I had to skip past a few super important chapters right in the middle of John. And so today, we're actually going to rewind and we're going to pick up those few chapters this week and next week. Anybody else excited for that? Man, I, I really uh, enjoyed this study, and I hope you have too. Um, so listen, it makes sense. As I was planning this series, it makes sense to study what we're going to study now Because if you've tracked along, we have studied the life of Jesus, his teaching, his miracles, and we've we've seen his death and his resurrection. And in the first century, after all of that, his first disciples, his first followers must have been thinking these two words, now what? Now what do we do? Now how do we live? Now how do we carry on this mission without you physically present with us, Jesus? And so Jesus talks about that. He actually talked about that before he left them in what we call the farewell discourse, this private time with his followers gathered together. And he explained to them, hey, I am leaving you, but this is how you will carry on without me physically present. This is how you will accomplish the mission without me physically present. This is how you have to treat each other without me physically present to get by. And so this is part 14 of our series where Jesus gives us the key to making that happen. And the key is this. He says he is the true vine. So we're going to unpack what that means this morning and the awesome implications it has for all of us who are asking those same questions and trying to follow Jesus today, here and now. Before we open to John chapter 15, I uh, want to pray together that God would bless the reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Well, God, we need your help today in knowing how to live. But really, God, in in one sense, we, we know how to live. We know how you want us to live. You want us to be loving. You want us to be joyful. You want us to be peacemakers. You tell us to be patient and kind. You tell us to be good and faithful and gentle, and self-controlled. We know how we should live, and yet, God, if we're honest with ourselves, we have a hard time doing it sometimes. We have a hard time living up to and living into your calling for us. And sometimes, God, it feels like the harder we try, the harder it is to grow in these areas. Well, I believe you have powerful words for us today. For those of us who feel this way today, who experience uh, this tension, and I believe, God, you want to free us from this burden and point us to the gospel. You want to point us to Jesus again today. So help us see him clearly and help us to remain in him, in the true vine. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Well, as I've been doing, as you turn to John 15, let me once again reorient you to where we are in the book of John. I've been doing this every week intentionally so that if you leave this series with nothing else, you can leave this series with this. Somebody asks you, hey, how is the book of John different from the other gospels? Well, Pastor Bill's been saying for 15 weeks in a row, (laughs) it's divided in half. There are two halves of the book of John. Other than the uh, prologue and epilogue, there's the book of signs and the book of glory. The book of signs is his public ministry where Jesus displays who he is through miracles that that John calls signs. They point to something. They point to his mission. The public ministry is part one. And the second half of the book is his private time 
in this final week with his closest followers, his disciples. And that's where we find ourselves this morning in the book of glory. We're, we're going to eavesdrop on his conversation with his disciples in, in the last days of his life. Uh, they, in chapter 13 and 14, are seated around a meal, and Jesus is laying out to them, guys, here is a, what's about to happen. I'm about to leave you. I'm about to die. I'm about to die on a Roman cross. And if you guys are going to make it in the world after I'm gone, here are the things you need to know. And remember what he did. I mean, he washed their feet, right? Remember this from Monday, Thursday. We talked about this. He washed their feet and said, you are to love each other with this servanthood, this kind of love that I've loved you. You have to love each other and love each other well. And he talked about the gift of the Holy Spirit. He prepared them for life after he was gone. And so in the end of chapter 14, it says they, that Jesus said, come now, let us go. And so apparently they left this meal, they left this room, and they went somewhere the, the gospel doesn't tell us exactly where they go, but we know they're headed toward the Mount of Olives. And so as we get into chapter 15 today, they, I imagine, are traveling to the Mount of Olives, and what would they have seen on their way? It's important. Remember, John, the setting is super important to understanding the deep meaning. So as they were walking toward the Mount of Olives, they were passing by the temple, uh, this is a model replica of uh, the temple that you can see if you visit Jerusalem. You can get an idea by the people here, the scale of it. But look how massive the temple complex is compared to the rest of the city. It's hard to miss. And if we zoom in, you can see this, uh, this holy place right here. Actually, uh, historians tell us, is decorated ornately with a vine, uh, a golden vine, this beautiful piece of artwork that was ordaining or uh, ornating. That's not a verb, is it? Ornating. It was, <laughs> what am I looking for? It was decorating. Yes. It was decorating the entrance to the holy place. And Josephus, the historian, tells us that these grape clusters, they were like as tall as a human man. It was just an enormous art display. People would bring their gold and their jewelry and add it to the display. It was amazing. And so I wonder if Jesus and his followers walking by this gigantic vine, if that's not what prompted Jesus to say this. John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. And so right away we see these beautiful words, I am. Am. This is another I am statement that Jesus has made. If somebody asks you about the Gospel of John, that's something else you can say. Hey, what's unique about John? There are seven of these I am statements and seven miraculous signs. Here, here are the I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true Vine. Notice in all of these, there's the word the, that's singular. Jesus is the whatever, and there's often a descriptor, like he is the good shepherd, as opposed to, we saw when we looked at that, chapter 10, he's the good shepherd as opposed to the, the bad shepherds, the ones who had failed Israel, the ones who did not accomplish their mission. And so today we're going to see something very similar. Jesus is saying, I am not just a vine, but I am the vine, and I am a true vine. And we, so this is going to be a predominant image for our study today. Jesus is the true vine. Um, I believe, and you're going to see, that this image carries through the entire sermon today. So Jesus, when he says, I'm the true vine, he's introducing a picture and a metaphor that's going to drive the rest of the conversation. But I think there's something more than just him choosing an appropriate image, like, oh, this would be handy. How about a vine? That'll do. I think there's a reason why it's a vine in particular, and it's a clue that it appears on the temple. Um, why is that? Let's think together about that. Why would Jesus compare himself to a vine? Well, it's because, I believe, throughout the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is compared to a vine. Look at this from Psalm uh, 80, verse 8. You, God, transplanted a vine from Egypt. 
you drove out the nations and planted it. What is this referring to? The exodus from Egypt, God saved the people and planted them, so to speak, in the promised land. And I want you to fast forward now toward the end of chapter 80, and you'll see something unique. Every time, I think every time you talk about a vine in the Old Testament, the picture is not good. And so at the end of this psalm, your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. And so, again, when we see the imagery of a vine representing Israel, when we see it in the Old Testament, it is in shambles. It is in terrible shape. Why is that? Why, why is the vine in such bad shape? Well, the, uh, the prophets make clear. Ezekiel 15 talks about this. Isaiah 5 talks about this. Let's just read this. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. This is God speaking. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? The prophet is saying God has done everything that he should have done for this vineyard, and yet at the end of the day, his people have not produced good fruit, good grapes, but only bad. Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard, the Lord says. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. Notice who is doing this, what I am going to do. God is causing the destruction, the trampling of his own vineyard, his own vine. Why is this? Verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah. So that just, again, affirms what we're talking about. What is the vineyard? What does it represent? The vineyard is Israel, Judah. And the people are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. And so these, this verse, uh, Isaiah 5, 7, just tells us in plain language what the analogy is trying to get at. God was looking for good fruit. What was the good fruit he was looking for? Justice and righteousness. But he didn't find that in his vineyard. What did he find instead? Bloodshed and cries of distress. See, this is the picture of the Old Testament. It's really super clear, right? God had saved a people for himself. He had, so to speak, planted them in the promised land and had given them a calling to reflect who he is to the whole world, to show his character to the world. Righteousness and justice, for instance. And they had failed Throughout this book, just pick a page, at every page, they had failed and failed and failed and failed to be the vine that God had asked them to be. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to John 15. With that context, doesn't that bring deeper meaning to Jesus when he says, I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener? It's like Jesus is saying, listen, I... Israel has failed its calling, but I, I have not failed my calling. In fact, I have fulfilled it exactly as God has given me. The mission God has given me, I have completed it perfectly, and I am the true vine. In verse 2, he goes on to say, My father is the gardener, and he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And I just want to pause here to point out something that I think is, is amazing if you look for it. And that is the gospel. Um, listen, th there's something going on here with this phrase, cuts off. What happens to parts of the vine that don't bear good fruit? We saw that in the Old Testament prophecy, right? God cuts them off. God allows them to be trampled. God allows them to be destroyed. God cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. Jesus bore fruit. And yet, 
at the end of his life, what happened to Jesus? He was cut off. And so right away at the, be- at the beginning of the message today, I want to share with you how this passage points to the gospel. And we see it right here in, in the first two verses. That Jesus was cut off. Jesus, the knife, so to speak, of the gardener came for him and cut him off. Why? Not because he had done anything wrong. He had succeeded perfectly in the mission. But he was cut off for you and for me. That's the beauty of the gospel that we preach here every week. Sin, salvation, and service. Our sin deserved punishment. Our, our sin deserved uh, the wrath of God and being cut off from God. But Jesus died in our place, was cut off in our place, so to speak, so that we could be empowered for mission to live with and for him. That's the gospel. And it's right here in these two verses. And, and here's the beautiful thing. Are you ready for this? Because Jesus was cut off, so to speak, you never will be cut off. There's something else that happens for us. Let's go back to these two verses and notice the the last phrase here. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And I want you to just know this. Uh, Jesus has been cut off in your place. And so now, if you sense God the Father, God the gardener, so to speak, coming at you with a knife in his hand, it is not to cut you off. It is instead to prune you. Isn't that amazing? What, what is pruning? I'm not a gardener. I know we've got some here. Uh, but what is pruning and why is it necessary? I would define it this way. Pruning removes whatever inhibits growth. Pruning is getting rid of and removing anything that gets in the way of growth. And God does that in our lives from time to time, doesn't he? Is anybody being pruned right now, like in this season? I bet I know some of you are. And it's painful. It, I mean, I, again, I'm not a gardener, and if I see somebody pruning a vine, I'm like, what in the world are they doing? That is so violent. What are you doing to that poor plant? You know, it looks like a massacre. You got all these good-looking leaves that end up on the floor, on the ground. You got these even fruit that are being cut off. And yet we know, if you know, which I don't know, but I'm told, <laughs> that is the most important, one of the most important parts of gardening and having a healthy plant is cutting away anything that gets in the way of growth. And that's clear that God does that to the people he loves. The book of Hebrews puts it this way. God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. God prunes us because he loves us. Continuing on in verse 3, Jesus says, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch by, uh, can bear f- fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Uh, there's a really interesting thing here going on in Greek, the original language. You might be wondering, hey, we're talking about gardening. We're talking about pruning. Why would he switch to a different picture, a different word picture, right in the middle of his story. Well, if you look in Greek, this is uh, the same root word as prune. And it makes sense, right? Pruning is removing anything that you don't want there. Cleaning is also removing anything that you don't want there. So they're just nouns and verbs of the same root word. And Jesus, I love this. Look at what he's saying. He's saying, you are already clean. I have cleaned you through my word, by the way. And it's like such a beautiful gospel truth that we can just hang on to. Hear Jesus say to us, like he said to them, you are clean because of what I've done for you. You are already clean. You don't have to do anything else. You're already clean. You're already in. You're already taken care of. Your guilt has already been washed away. You are already clean. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to clean yourself up. I've done it. And the second half of that, well, what comes next? I'm already clean, so what do I do? Well, Jesus says, how about this? You just stay in me. In me, you're clean. In me, you've been uh, purified. In me, you have forgiveness. In me, you have right standing with God. In me, you have adoption into his family. In me. So this is the plan. Remain in me. 
And that sounds like a pretty good plan to me. We're going to see that, that word become a theme through the rest of our teaching today. Remain in me is the key verb, the imperative, the command, so to speak, for us today. Remain in me. Moving on to verse 5, he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And so there's two halves of this, right? There's the truth we saw on the previous slide. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. And then the other half is, listen, if you do not remain in me, then you will not bear good fruit. In fact, you can do nothing. And I think we see that clearly this time of year, right? It's beautiful out there. Let's just say that. We can see some principles of gardening just looking around. This is the view from my office window. I love my view out back. And there's these two kinds of trees. Again, I don't know what tree is what, but by their, by their flowers, you can tell they're two different kinds of trees growing together. It's beautiful. This is a tree out front with a little bit of editing, uh, that I, a photo I took last year. And this is at my house. I think that's a magnolia tree. And this time of year, it's beautiful to see life coming into these branches and through the branches into these flowers and leaves and even eventually fruit. But sometimes you see that interrupted and that not happening. Uh, this is a street near me where I live, and th these trees used to be just beautiful, just like so full of flowers. It just is amazing. And yet we had a really hard winter this year, right? There were these flash freezes and this really heavy snow. And this tree, this poor tree, just took such a beating. And so you can tell this year something's not right with this tree, and something's not healthy with this tree. And there's some connection that's been lost between the branches and the source of life. And so they're beginning to die. And in fact, you might see even this in your yard. Uh, I don't share this picture on social media or anywhere else. It's like, happy spring, everybody. Why, why don't we share pictures like this? this? This has been separated from the tree. And it is dying if not dead. You don't see leaves actively growing on branches in your yard. You do not see flowers growing on branches separated from trees. You don't see fruit growing because they've been cut away from the source of their life. The, the branch has to be connected to the vine to receive life. And the same is true, John says, with human beings Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you're cut off from me, you can't do anything. I'm your source of life. And look what that relationship looks like. I love this, verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What does it look like when a branch is still attached to a tree? There's a flow back and forth of nutrients, right? It is connected. And Jesus is almost saying, like, listen, there's the same thing going on in our relationship. And in my words, you're hearing from me. And in your prayers, you're talking to me and you're asking me. And there's this communication because it's a relationship, and relationships grow and remain connected through communication. And he even says this wild thing about that connection. He says, whatever you ask, it'll be done for you. And we don't want to read more into that than is there. I mean, the fact is, when we align ourselves with God, when we are grafted into that tree, when we become one with that tree, uh, when we align ourselves with his will and his way and his purposes, then our prayers will align with his will and his way and his purposes. And those are the kind of prayers that he loves listening to and answering. All that to say, when you're connected to the tree, there's communication, there's, there's a flow. You're in his word and you're praying. Verse 9, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. So we're starting to see some things here. To, to remain in him, to remain in his word, to remain in his love. 
And look at what kind of love we're supposed to remain in. Look at this. What, what is the kind of love? It's the same kind of love that the Father has for the Son, for Jesus. That's the kind of love Jesus has for you. That's the kind of love Jesus has for me. The same amount, the same type, the same quality of love that the Father has for him. Can you even begin to fathom what kind of love this is? He says, that's how I love you. Remain in that love. And here's what that looks like, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Uh, Jesus says, listen, the Father loves me and I love the Father, and here's part of what it looks like for me to love the Father is I obey him and I do his will. And if you love me, that's gonna be true of you too. If you love me, then you are going to obey me. And look at this. That obedience leads to what? Joy. Well, when, do you, when else in our world do you see these two words go together? Commands and joy. Obedience and joy. Obey and joy. Some of us tend to think like they're two like incompatible, like other side of the room kind of concepts. Like obedience is the opposite of joy. But in the Bible... The truth is that obedience leads to joy. Obedience is how you find joy. Obedience is how you enter into joy that is complete, is over the top, is the best joy you've ever experienced. Why is that? It's because God created you. And God knows you. And God knows how life works. And God designed life to work a certain way. And so when you obey his commands, when you live his way, in the world he created, as his creation, life works a lot better. And you can find joy in obedience. But notice this with me before we move on. This is evidence that you love him. Obedience doesn't earn love. That would violate the rest of the things we've been talking about so far. The text does not say that. Obedience doesn't earn love. Obedience is evidence of our love for God. Last two verses we'll look at. Jesus says, my command is this. So he's talk, he said, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. Okay, what have you commanded, Jesus? Tell us what this really looks like. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. I love that we don't have to wonder what command he's talking about. He says the command is this. It is love. That's how we fulfill what God is asking of us. And look at this great reminder. We're going to end here, and it's kind of like ending where we started. We love each other as Jesus has loved us. And what does that look like? It looks like this, laying down one's life for one's friends. Remember where they're headed. They are walking on a journey. And remember where the journey takes Jesus. And again, we end where we began, with the gospel. Jesus said these words, greater love is no one than this. And he lays down his life for his friends. And he was about to literally do that on the cross. And that is what he wants you to remain in. To use an old school word, to abide in in, to stay in, to make your home in, to wake up to and to go to bed to, to fill your thoughts with, to live your entire experience out of this love. And that is what he's trying to get across to his followers in a nutshell. You're wondering about how to make it after I'm no longer physically present with you. You wonder how you're going to accomplish the mission. You wonder how you're going to treat each other. You wonder how you're going to make it through the world and live. Well, here it is. You remain in my love. You remain in my sacrificial love for you. That's it. That's how you, that's how you do it. That's the command this morning is to remain in his love. That's the secret. That's what he's trying to get around, across to us this morning. You remain. You stay. You remain planted in the, in the vine. 
And that works. I just want to tell you why that works. Many of you may have been trying to overcome sin for quite a while now. And, you, and it's like playing whack-a-mole. And you just, you get control of one part of your life and it's a little bit sinful. And then all of a sudden something else springs up. And you, you whack that mole and then something else springs up. And, and you're just trying so hard. And the harder you try, the harder it is. And the truth that you discover is that it's not that easy. Sin is not that easy. Sin is much deeper than external conformity and mechanistic just behavior can fix. It's a heart issue, isn't it? Every time I sin, it reveals something about my heart. It's not just that I had a little mess up here and there, but something is, something's wrong with what I love. Something's wrong with what I value. Something's wrong with what I worship. And so Jesus tells his followers then and today, listen, to bear fruit, you can't play whack-a-mole anymore. It's not going to work. You've got a deeper problem and it's in your heart. And if you, instead of that, will remain rooted in this, if you will fill your vision with this, if you will fill your mind with this, if you will remain in that, if you'll make your home in that, my love for you, it's going to change your heart. It's going to change your desires. It's going to change your values. It's going to change you from the inside out. It's going to change what you worship. And so I'm glad we started with the gospel today and we ended with the gospel today because this passage, if you read it wrong and if you read it backwards, it can look like it's saying something it's not saying. It can look like it's saying, in order to remain in God's love, you got to pray. And in order to remain in God's love, you got to read his word. And in order to remain in God's love, you got to obey and bear the right fruit. But I don't think that's what it's saying at all. In fact, the, the order is the opposite. The key word is remain. And when you remain in this, it leads to obedience. And what does obedience look like? It looks like love. And what does all of this lead to? It leads to joy. That's how I see all of these concepts connected. For us, the task is remaining. And so as we close this morning, just a few questions for you. Think about how this applies in our lives. First question, how are you growing spiritually? Uh, how do you see yourself growing? That's a great, uh, great question to ask. But also, what's your method? Like, how are you going about pursuing spiritual growth? How are you doing? I mean, if you look at your life now versus when you became a Christian, are you still struggling with the same things? Are you still as selfish as ever? You know, are you still tr struggling to love people well? Are you still struggling to be generous? Or are you seeing improvements? And the real improvement, like we just said, comes from remaining. So how do you remain? How do you remain in God? What, what do, <laughs> I hear you saying, like, Pastor Bill, I get it, but that's a weird like, imperative. That's a weird command. Remain. How do I remain? Well, how about this for an idea? You remain here. You remain connected to the other parts of the vine, your brothers and sisters in Christ, your church family. Um, don't cut yourself off from your church family. It'll be like you're cutting yourself off from the tree. We're here for you. The people sitting around you, the people in your small groups, the people you serve with are here for you to help you stay pointed to Jesus. Don't cut yourself off. Remain in the body of Christ. Also, don't cut yourself off from his word. Again, his word has to abide in you. His word has to remain in you. He speaks to you through his word. So remain in his word. Read it. Meditate on it. Study it. Memorize it. And then remain in prayer. Remain connected to God. Remain connected to Jesus by talking to him. Communication builds a relationship. Don't cut yourself off in any of these ways or others from the Lord, but stay connected. Again, not as a me mechanistic, like legalistic thing, but not that praying earns your way into God's favor or family or forgiveness. Not that reading the Bible does that. Not that attending church does that. But all of those things help you stay connected to the vine and stay connected to his love. And everything else flows out of that. Application question two. How are you being pruned? I, I look around and I have some ideas for how some of you are being pruned. And man, it's, uh, it's no fun, is it? 
The question on the screen is not, are you being pruned, but how are you being pruned? Because if you're a Christian, the answer is yes. If you're a Christian, the answer is yes, God is doing something in my life right now. The question is, what is he cutting away? What is he cutting away? The, the attitudes, the values that don't get you closer to Christ. I know it's painful, and it looks violent and wasteful to watch a gardener hack away at a tree, but that gardener loves the plant, that's why he's doing it, and God loves you, and that's why he's doing it. I want you to hang on to this quote. Tim Keller said this so beautifully, I can't say it any better. A skilled gardener never prunes off anything that wouldn't have been a loss to keep and a gain to lose. Let me say that again. God, the great gardener in your life, he will never prune off anything that wouldn't have been a loss to keep and a gain to lose. If you've lost it, it's for a reason. If you've gained it, it's for a reason. Through faith, we can trust, even if we don't fully understand, but we can still trust that God knows what he's doing and God is up to something good in our lives. How is God pruning you? Can you see that through faith this morning? And then the final application question for you this morning is, how are you loving as Jesus loved? This is hard, right? Jesus defined obedience as love, as loving other people well. But if you look around at the Christian church today, not ours in particular, but the church worldwide, but in America especially, man, it's a wreck, isn't it? (laughs) Um, Our culture is more divided than ever and hateful and spiteful and mistrusting, and that, that has come right into our churches, and it's a shame, and it hurts our witness, and it hurts our spiritual lives. And so I just want to ask you the question, how are you loving others as Jesus has loved you And maybe as we close in the silence of these final moments together, you can even ask God to open your eyes and reveal to you the ways that you can be loving. And by the way, next week we will take this up as our only topic for the week. We're going to turn to John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer, where he prays, and it's on his heart, the very last thing he prays pretty much before he goes to the cross And what does he pray? That we would love each other well and that we would be one as he and the Father are one. That we would be unified. So how can you love others as Jesus loved you? A serious question, an important question to think about. Let's pray. Well, God, it's, uh, it's a challenging question. to ask, are we loving well? Because if we're honest, the answer is probably not great. Definitely not as good as you did because you laid down your life for us while we were still sinners, by the way. And so, Father, even in this, this moment of quietness, I sense that you want to prune some things away from us and through the eyes of faith, we want to lean into that and say, God, that's good. Do, do the work. Even though it hurts, do the work. But God, most of all, we want to end by just reminding ourselves that you are the true vine. You are the true vine. You accomplished what Israel should have accomplished, and you accomplish perfectly what we should have done, what I should have done, and what I failed to do. And we just want to give you all the glory for that and all the thanks for that. And we want to live inside that love. We want to abide in that love. We want to remain in that love all day, every day. And let that fuel our transformation and our growth. Thank you for doing that, Jesus. We love you and praise you. Amen.